Yo, guess who's back with a new addition here? Today we're gonna to talk about stretching. Should you do it before your training, after your training, or perhaps maybe not at all? We're gonna get into that today. Well, the answer really depends on three things. Number one, what type of stretching are you really talking about? I'll explain a couple of different types today. Number two, how long are you stretching for? And how long are you stretching prior to when you're gonna exercise or do your competition? And then number three, how bad your mobility or your movement or your flexibility really is. All right, so I'm gonna answer these questions very directly and very clearly, uh, but more importantly, this gives us an opportunity to talk about the physiology and neurology of stretching and movement in general. So that's really what the bulk of the video is dedicated to, helping you have these answers, of course, but really understanding why they're true, right? If you've seen any of my videos or ever seen any of my material really, you know that I'm really much more interested in people understanding the why behind the answer, right? The theory is if you understand the methods, or in this case, the physiology, then you're never gonna have a problem answering the question when the scenario changes a little bit, right? So don't just memorize answers, understand how things work, and you'll never have to memorize again. So that's the goal today. Having said that, if you wanna just zoom to the end and get the answer to this, fine, you can but you're gonna be much better off taking the time to learn some of the physiology as we go along. So let's dive right into it. The two types of stretching I'm gonna talk about really are what we'll call dynamic and static. Now static is what you've traditionally seen before, right? It's the hold the hamstring stretch for 30 seconds, it's hold this for two minutes, whatever, right? It's holding a position in a static, not moving, uh, typically at an end range of motion or close to it. Now dynamic is a little bit complicated. And if you look at the research on this topic, you're gonna to get confused because a lot of the authors aren't really clear when they're talking about static stretching versus dynamic stretching and how that's different than dynamic warm up. All right, so this is gonna actually lead to a lot of confusion in the field. If you're trying to read stuff or you've heard somebody else talk about that, make sure they're clarifying whether they're talking about dynamic warm up or dynamic stretching, or if they even differentiate the two. So in my mind, dynamic warm-up are things like a walking active movement, right? So an, uh, an active body weight squat where you're maybe increasing the range of motion or how low you can get in your squat, but you're kind of doing it through the movement itself. You're really just getting warmed up. So you, what you'll see there uh, are the pros and cons uh, of the static versus dynamic here in a second, but you know what they are, right? You know the difference between standing and holding a hamstring stretch for two minutes versus doing, say, an active hamstring movement where you're kicking your leg up and down. Okay, so I'm not going to really differentiate between dynamic warm-up and dynamic stretching at this point, though others may. Okay, so hopefully you get the basic idea of dynamic movement stuff versus a static hold. And so really what we can talk about is the pros and cons of both. Again, if you've seen anything I ever do, I don't talk about things being good or bad. I like to understand well, what's the benefit and what's the consequence, and then you can deploy the appropriate thing at the appropriate time. So the benefit of dynamic stretching is it can improve what I'll call nervous, or the nerves, muscle, and the connective tissue. What I mean by that is you can see improvements in performance. If you look at the literature on this, you'll see things like dynamic warm-up improve your maximal strength, your sprinting speed, perhaps your vertical jump, things like that. If you've ever exercised before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. No one would ever set a max on their back squat walking in cold off of the street with no warm-up. You would, of course, progressively build up, do a little bit more weight until you get closer, have a bit of a, what's called a potentiating effect and some other ancillary benefits of simply increasing core temperature, blood flow, etc. Okay, so there's really no dispute there that a dynamic warm up of some type will enhance performance. The downside of dynamic is it's not gonna be very good typically at actually improving permanent changes in range of motion or flexibility. Now, I don't want to confuse anyone here, but I am actually a proponent of getting a lot of your changes in your, your flexibility through movements. So for example, I do believe that if you do heavy dosed or fairly heavy dosed, say squatting, and you try to push the end range of motion, and by end range of motion, I mean end range of your quality of movement. So right when you start to lose position, say. Well, you work on that enough, you spend enough time in there, you're gonna see improvements in that range of motion, all right? So I'm not disputing that, but the point being, if all you did for a warm-up were jumping jacks and burpees, don't expect to see improvements in your hamstring flexibility. You're not spending enough time in those positions. Right? It's not going to really happen. That's really what I'm going to get at. 
And so if we encounter someone who's simply got all the requisite mobility and flexibility they need, they can probably jump right to dynamic warm-ups and be fine. But if somebody has a small or especially a large deficit in range of motion, uh, mobility, flexibility, whatever you want to call it, or whatever is the actual issue, we got to maybe think about adding some static stretching. So the benefit of the static is you're going to probably see more, much more likelihood of increasing permanent or what I'll call a chronic range of motion. We can also see that acutely. And so anyone who, again, say if you're a power lifter and you start warming up and your hips are just not there, well, you continue, you, if you hold a, say, go down the bottom of a squat and hold it for a minute, you come back up, you'll see increased range of motion right now. That's what I call acute, so it has an immediate effect. It'll also help you build up range of motion or mobility or flexibility over time. Okay, and we'll get into the physiology of this in a second. The downside is they're going to probably reduce performance, right? And so what happens is they dissipate what's called kinetic energy, and I'll get into that in a little bit. They also can inhibit or turn off muscle spindles. Both of these things are going to re result in a decrease in performance, and we see this in the literature as well. In fact, it's very well documented. If you do, say, a, a a one minute hamstring hold, you're probably going to reduce your ability to do vertical jump. Uh, speed goes down, squatting strength can go down, things like that. Same thing if you stretched your pec or your triceps and then did a bench press. So we don't want to be holding long stretches right before a maximal effort performance. But that doesn't mean we don't do static stretching. And that doesn't even necessarily mean we don't do static stretching before our workouts. We've got some things to get to here before we get a full answer on whether we should stretch before, after, or never. Well, let's, let's look at the physiology really quickly. Now remember, human movement is comprised of three areas. We tend to think of human movement as a function of muscle. But that's not the entire picture here. So look at my three different boxes, the green one, the blue one, and the red one. And then look at the image. You're going to see that the box on the left-hand side corresponds with an image on the right-hand side. So the first part of human movement is the nervous system. That's the green box. So the nerve has to come in, tell a muscle to contract. The muscle has to contract. It's got to transfer its force from there to the connective tissue that surrounds the muscle. That connective tissue comes together and makes a tendon. That tendon attaches to the bone. The muscle then pulls the tendon or the connective tissue. The connective tissue pulls the tendon. Tendon moves the bone. You move. So we have to think about all three of these layers or levels of human movement. Nervous, the nerves, nervous system, the muscle itself, and three, the connective tissue, the tendon, the ligaments, and things like that. Okay, now, I'm gonna get, I got into this in a lot more detail in a separate video. If you want to look around, or perhaps, Ryan, you can link this if it's possible, I don't remember. Um, but the video I've made on how to get stronger but not add muscle, I go into, I think, maybe even a half an hour or more of the physiology of movement with things like this. So we can get more detailed there. Um, you may have to jump ahead in the semester if you're in class, uh, or if you're just learning at home, come back and watch this video, uh, this one. But that's the one you wanna go to, okay? So that's a quick version of the physiology. Now that being said, there's two parts of the nervous system we gotta think about. And those fall under the umbrella of what's called proprioception. If you're in exercise science or have had these classes before, that term should ring a bell. I know you've had it in exercise physiology. But proprioception is the idea of the nervous system understanding where you are at in the space, okay? It's got two primary branches that we need to think about when we're talking about stretching. Branch number one is what I'll call muscle spindles. Okay, now these are buried inside the middle of the muscle belly. And for the most part, they don't contain a lot of actin or myosin, which means they don't contribute to contraction. They're sensory organs. Just like you have a sense of smell, sight, and hearing, you have a sense of where you're at in space based on these muscle spindles, right? Sensory organs take input in from the outside world and tell your neurology, your brain stem, your brain and spinal cord, what's happening. That's exactly what muscle spindles do. They sense stretch. So unlike your olfactory foramen that senses smell, it tells you what's going on in your environment, what's you know, wind and things around you. Your muscle spindles tell your body where, if your muscles have been stretched. So here's what happens with the muscle spindle. Okay, so a muscle spindle uh, will t sense a stretch. Imagine your hamstring is being stretched. That muscle spindle is stretched. It sends information out via gamma motor neurons. Those gamma motor neurons go to your spinal cord. This is an involuntary reaction, right? We don't have to go all the way to the brain and think about this, just to the spinal cord. It comes back out through what are called alpha motor neurons. 
So any of you that have had exercise physiology, you, you remember uh, the, a, a phrase that we throw out all the time. And if you're, any of you are taking any kind of personal trainer or strength coach certification, I almost guarantee you they're going to ask about uh, what a quote unquote motor unit is. And I know you know the answer because it's something you've memorized. It's an alpha motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it innervates. Well, that alpha motor neuron is exactly what we're talking about. So the muscle spindle, spindles, its muscle spindle senses it's being stretched, sends information via gamma motor neurons. The gamma motor neurons go to the central nervous system, in this case the spine, and the spine sends a signal back out through the, through the alpha motor neurons and tell the muscle fibers that are surrounding the muscle spindle to contract. This is why we call this a stretch shortening cycle. So the hamstring is being stretched. The muscle spindles in the hamstring sense that stretch. They send a signal to the spine. The spine sends a signal back to the other muscle fibers in your hamstring and tell it to contract. So the stretch is met with the resulting shortening of the muscle. And that's the cycle, right? This is what keeps you from snap, and this is what, what allows you to snap back into place. So if I were to put your arm in this position here, if I just made you relax, it would snap back to here. That's in part because of the muscle spindles and other part because of the connective tissue, right? But if I put you on a stretch, the default is to bring you back to this anatomical position of here. Okay? So the muscle spindles and the stretch shortening cycle is incredibly important for sport performance. Is what gives us a snap, a bounce, a response, a quick contraction. It's very, very, very helpful. Okay, now don't worry about the, the image you're seeing here, intrafusal versus extrafusal. Intrafusal is a fancy way of saying muscle spindle. Extrafusal are all the fibers that are not a muscle spindle, basically. Okay, but again, key point, muscle spindles uh, are in this, the belly. They don't have a lot of the muscles, so deep inside the middle. They're not there for contraction, they're sensory organs. All right, so if you see the image over there, uh, you've all probably had this happen to you, but you've gone to a physician for a physical, and they've done this knee tap test, right? So you imagine sitting, and I'll go back to the image here, sitting on a chair and your knee's hanging down, a doctor comes in, hits your knee, and your leg flakes out, right? So why does that actually happen? Well, first of all, why is the doctor doing that? Why do you have to get that done before you can play a sport? Well. It's because they're actually trying to look at the nervous system in general and in some parts your spine. So they know that this stretch shortening cycle thing happens. So what they do is they actually press quickly on your patella tendon. Okay, The patella tendon, you can see from the image, wraps around the kneecap and inserts on the front of the shin. But all of your quadriceps muscles come together to make that and turn into that one large tendon. So if I press just below the kneecap, on the patella tendon, it stretches the quadricep over top of the knee. So the muscle spindles within the quadricep should sense that stretch and respond very quickly with contraction. So when I smack the bottom of your knee there, right below your kneecap, we quickly stretch the quadriceps. The quadriceps then result in a quick contraction and your, knee, and your foot flings up in the air. If that doesn't work for some reason, you could have some sort of neurological issue or spinal cord issue going on, right? Now, some people just don't respond to that thing very well, uh, so don't freak out, but that's what they're doing. Now, what you also would notice with this test is if you tapped very lightly, you wouldn't see a response. Also, if you tapped hard but slowly, you wouldn't see the response either. And so the amount of stretch shortening cycle contraction we get is in part based on how hard it's stretched and how quickly it's stretched. We're going to come back to this concept in a little bit here, but don't forget that stretch shortening cycle is dependent upon, again, the level of stretch as well as how quickly it is stretched. All right, so the knee tap test, that's what that thing's all about. Now the Golgi tendon organs are a little bit different. The name is directly within the name, right? They, are, they live in the tendons. So the muscle spindles live in the muscle, the GTOs, Golgi tendon organs, live in the tendon. And unlike spindles where they sense stretch and respond by contracting, GTOs sense tension and respond by telling the muscle to stop contracting. Now, the common thing that we teach in class here is from the image you can imagine, it is a sensory organ just like a spindle. So the tendon, right, remember, to, which is the part that connects the muscle to the bone, uh, is gonna sense a lot of force, a lot of contraction. Like think, of, think in the situation of you're doing a really heavy muscle contraction, you're trying to pick something up and there's a lot of force going on in the tendon and the GTO decides this is too much, 
I'm gonna send a signal back to the spinal cord and block those same alpha motor neurons. So again, unlike a spindle which causes contraction, a GTO causes relaxation. So instead of stimulating the alpha motor neurons, it inhibits the alpha motor neurons. And so you can see the little stop octagon I've got there on the other image. And so we've got this little bit of a complementary system. The muscle spindles send stretch and put you back into the same spot. Uh, easy example, if you were to stand on one foot and imagine you're falling to one side, to the outside over here, the medial parts, the inside of my calf would start being stretched as I fall this direction. So as the medial part of my calf is being stretched, the muscle spindles would activate, contract, and pull me back to midline. That's the point of a muscle spindle, right? A GTO is a little bit different. If I were to be stretching my, my calf too far here, and the GTO thought that we're in a situation where if we continue to have force production in this muscle, something will tear, it'll stop the contraction. All right, so two different functions, both a bit protective. One to put you back to midline, and the other to stop you from tearing the muscle. Now, I'll be honest with you here, I don't think that's exactly what GTOs do. In fact, most research indicates that's not actually what they do. But we'll have to come back to this later. Or maybe, maybe, best case scenario, you'll go into a deep dive and look up GTOs, what they actually function, what the research says, and maybe there's somebody out there who's a GTO expert, and you can let me know, send me an email, or uh, write a comment here and correct me here, because I don't actually think that's how they work. But for the part of our story, and you know what, I'm a man who doesn't believe that the truth should ever get in the way of a good story, so we're going to move right on. Okay, so if we go back to this original concept then, how does this apply to dynamic and static stretching? Well, I said earlier, the consequence of dynamic stretching is it's not going to really induce a lot of permanent changes in range of motion. Well, why? Well, on the flip side, why does static allow both acute, so immediate, and long-term changes in range of motion? How does this actually happen? Now that we know a little bit about the physiology of movement, let's take a look. Here's back to our schematic. Well, what, here's what we know. If I do some static stretching, I can see very acute changes in range of motion, very immediate, and that's probably mostly because of the nervous system. So think about it. I'm mean, touch your toes right now. Well, give it two more seconds, three more seconds. You see an immediate improvement in your quote unquote range of motion of your hamstrings within seconds. Do you think your hamstring muscle really got longer or hamstrings got longer in that side? No, of course they didn't. Then why are you able to actually touch your toes? You may have seen people do things like you stand here and just rub your hamstring or rub a lacrosse ball on the bottom of your foot and you immediately see an improvement in range of motion. That's not because of the muscle, it's not because of level two. It's because of level one. You've got a little bit of neurology that's holding on. And this is why we can also do fun things like rub the back of our head or have perhaps a needle stuck in our arm or even do breathing drills. And somehow we immediately see improvements in range of motion. Well, there is a neurological component, right? You can be held in neurological positions because of stress, anxiety, uh, or other issues, right? And so if I do static stretching, when I go to stretch my hamstrings, for example, remember those muscle spindles immediately turn on. If you stretch the hamstring, it wants to contract and fight that. But after a few seconds, it realizes, oh, 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 well, this is intentional. Okay, well, relax. And so what happens is a couple of seconds in, the muscle spindles that are fighting you relax and you start to gain range of motion. But remember, that's coming from you not actually gaining a range of motion. It's just you letting go of the restriction you had. It's kind of a double negative, right? So you remove the inhibitor, and you're actually able to get to that current range of motion that you, that you uh, enjoy. Okay? The other thing that can happen is this. Now, there's a method of stretching that is very effective called PNF, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation stretching. So let's take the example of the hamstrings muscle group, and let's imagine we're doing a hamstring stretch, whichever one you like. It could be the seated hurdler stretch or whatever one you're doing. Now, if you were to sit there and you, if you were, while you stretched your hamstring, you flexed your quad really, really hard. In fact, if you've ever paid attention, you notice that's what we're always cueing, right? If you're stretching your hip flexor, what should you be squeezing? Your glute, right? If I'm stretching my tricep, we should be flexing the opposite side. So we're always flexing the exact opposite muscle. Why is that? This is a good cueing thing, right? Flexing my quad when I'm there. 
flex my glute when I'm searching my hamstring, etc. Well, if I flex, imagine again we're doing a hamstring stretch. If I flex my quad really hard, I get more hamstring range of motion. Why is that? Because the muscle spindles in the hamstring are turned off when the opposite muscles contract. It's called reciprocal inhibition. Body understands, oh, I'm trying to contract with my quad. Well, in order to do that, I have to let go of my hamstring to let my quad actually move. If not, I'd be stuck in an isometric hold. And so if we're trying to gain range of motion, we can trick our neurological system to turning off the muscle spindles by flexing the opposite muscle really, really hard. Now, that's not exactly PNF stretching, but it's a really good concept for stretching. PNF is really the second bullet point, which is now what we would do is we would flex that quadricep, we would get a nice big range of motion in our hamstrings. And then we would start contracting our hamstring, of course, let go of the quadricep. But you would flex the hamstring one, two, three, four, five, or whatever you want to do, five seconds, 10 second hold, something like that, where you flex the hamstring. Then you relax the hamstring and you notice, oh wow, I can stretch my hamstring farther now. What happened? This contract, relax, contracts idea is called PNF stretching, and it takes advantage of the GTOs. So remember, the GTOs and the hamstrings are going to sense tension, and they cause the hamstring to relax. Remember, they block the alpha motor neurons. So if I put a little bit of tension in them on, on purpose, activate the GTOs, the, the GTOs will then block the muscle activation and cause the muscle to relax. Because of that, I gain an acute range of motion. So I can use this again acutely or chronically. Number one, if, I, if I'm just needing to get some hamstring flexibility or some uh, tricep flexibility or whatever I need, I can do a little bit of stretching prior to my workout and gain some acute range of motion. I can also use this as a chronic stretching tool and it's fairly effective. In fact, it's probably my favorite method of stretching for that purpose. Uh, and that's working because of what's called autogenic inhibition, but it's the same idea, right? You're turning on the GTOs, getting the muscle to relax. Very good thing for, honestly, just general relaxation, too. So if you're trying to do some relaxation drills the night before a big competition or you're stressed because of finals week or something like that, just spend 10 minutes doing a whole body, I mean, six minutes, three minutes, doing a whole body uh, PNF stretch kind of thing, autogenic ambition, turn things on, let it relax, gain range of motion, etc. So it's really, really helpful for that. Okay, so that's the acute side. On the chronic side, here's what we probably know. If you see any improvements in range of motion or flexibility over the course of say, hey, a month later, two months later, three months later, it's probably not nervous system based, right? Again, if you fix that, if you have that issue, that's kind of just kind of get you to the level that you normally have. You're gonna stop the blocking. But how do you add more range of motion? Well, it's not gonna come from muscle either. Now, technically, there's a mechanism in which you can add sarcomeres and serial line and lengthen the actual muscle, but that is uh, a different thing really entirely. My money, and we need more research in this area, no doubt about it, but my money is that any real changes in range of motion you have are actually coming from the connective tissue. All right? And what we know is that takes time and load. So you have to kind of hold and be in those positions for a very long time. Because remember, there's no blood flow in a connective tissue. It's not something that's really that plastic and adaptable compared to the muscle itself. And so we have to invest a bit of time in the connective tissue to really see changes there. But that is much easier to do than actually lengthening the muscle itself. My estimation anyways. Again, and we do need more research in this area. It's not at all clear. But that's probably what we're looking at. So if we look at the package combined, Static stretching is going to give us that nervous system because of autogenic and reciprocal inhibition, and it's going to give us, or it's allow us to see improvements and changes in the connective tissue itself, which will actually lead to changes in position. And so if we, if we really have an athlete or an, a client, individual, or yourself that really actually needs to see some changes in mobility, flexibility, we don't want to eliminate static stretching entirely. We need to understand when to use it, though. And so we'll come back to our, our thing here, we'll, we'll, we'll do the inverse, which is talk about dynamic. So we said the pros of dynamic are that they can improve performance, the consequences are of static are they can they hurt performance. So let me give you an example. Do me a favor here. If you're able to, I want you to stand up and I want you to perform a counter movement jump. I'll give you just a second. If you don't know what that is, stand up nice and tall, dip as fast as you can, and jump size you can. Now, don't land on anything and tear an ACL or roll an ankle or anything, but go ahead and do one for me. 
If you're on the ground, do an explosive jump push up. Do some real explosive movement. Go ahead and do it. I'm not, I'm not kidding. We're not moving on. No, we're going to stay right here until all of you do it. Every single one of you. Do it. Do it. Okay, you jumped. Counter movement. Now, do it one more time, but do it faster. In other words, remember the muscle spindle thing? If I do a counter movement jump and then try to explode versus dip and drive, the faster you dip and drive, the more muscle spindle activation we get, the higher you'll jump, right? So we're using muscle spindles to our advantage. By putting the hamstrings and glutes on a quick stretch, we can goat or convince or, or cheat our glutes and hamstrings into contracting really quickly. Okay, got that counter movement jump in. Now what I want you to do is this. Stand up, all the way, shake it out. I'm gonna have you squat all the way down. Now I would do it right now, but I, you would lose me on camera. In fact, hell with it. Okay, I'm gonna squat all the way down and hold. And now Ryan's gonna let this clock. Ryan, can you, if you could put a clock on the screen here and let it run for a minute, go. And we're gonna hold this position for a whole minute. And you should notice a couple of different things. Hey, number one, as the seconds go by, stay, get your ass back down there. I didn't say stand up, hold that squat. Hold it all the way down there. As the time goes on, you'll start to see an improvement in range of motion. Right, remember what we talked about earlier? Hey, you static stretch, you will see acute range of motion improvements. Neurological systems turning off, in other words, turning muscle spindles off. TTOs, probably not doing a lot here, but muscle spindles are going on and you're seeing a very small in fact, maybe fairly large improvement range of motion. Keep holding, keep holding. Ryan, you let this thing run until that whole minute comes up. And at the end of this minute, we're going to jump up as high as you can. Now, a couple of things before we jump. Do not bounce. So don't re-dip. Don't stand up a little bit. Go back down and then jump. I want you to go from exactly where you're at right now. And when this one minute clock ends, explode and jump up. Boom. Now, how many of you got very high in the air? Probably none of you. In fact, some of you probably didn't even clear the ground. Now, which one of these times, this one or the counter movement jump, did you jump higher? Certainly the one before, right? Well, why is that? Why did that short bout of static stretching, although it improved range of motion, why did it hurt performance? Well, two things. Number one, it's actually dissipating kinetic energy. And so the way we create human movement is a three-part system, nerve, muscle, and connective tissue, right? Well, the nerve is a signal. The actual contraction or force production comes from the muscle and the connective tissue. So your muscle can contract anytime you tell it to, and it has its own way to produce ATP and energy to create force. But the only thing we can do for connective tissue, since it doesn't have actinomycin, it doesn't have metabolism really, is we can put some energy in the system called kinetic energy, and then extract some energy out. So by putting a muscle on stretch, we start stretching connective tissue and we start putting energy into that system. But if you hold that for long enough, that energy eventually dissipates. So then when I go to contract, I'm left with only the muscle that contribute to force production. I mean, imagine a rubber band. If I held the rubber band, I pulled it back a little bit and let it go, it would snap with some force. If I pulled it back, a lot, it would snap with a lot more force, right? So more stretch, more force. And if I pulled it back quickly and snapped it, I would get a big snap out of it. All right, well, again, see the strength video on all this? But think of the connective tissue like a rubber band. If though I pulled that rubber band way out and then held it like that for 10 years, when I let it go, what would happen to the rubber band? It probably wouldn't move at all, right? So we lost the elasticity there. Now that as an extreme example, but the same thing's happening on a smaller level where you can lose the kinetic energy that we store up in the connective tissue. So, again, to reiterate, the acute stretch, right? If I already dip and drive, the more stretch, the more force production. But if I do it for too long, I lose my kinetic energy. And the faster the stretch, the more force production, okay? So then take a look at something like this. Right, you've all seen somebody do this. Oh, what happened right there? Let's think about the physiology. So Parrot's going down there, he's squatting, and right there. Why'd he do that? 
right? Why do people bounce at the bottom? We'll see it on a bench press, right? Come back up, maybe rebound, bounce back up. We see it very con consistently in a squat. Well, what happens? As you're sitting at the bottom of that squat there, we start to lose that kinetic energy. So that means our contribution for force production are going entirely on the muscle. We're losing all of the connective tissue. But what happens if I do that quick little rebound? Aha, uh -huh. I can actually put some energy back into that connective tissue and I can reactivate muscle spindles. Because remember, when we statically stretch like that, the muscle spindles turn off. But if I kind of shake them out for a quick second, even a half second like that, we get a little bit of connective uh, muscle spindle activation again. All right, so should I bounce like that? Well, what have we learned? Everything has a pro and a con, right? So we got to think through it. Why do that rebound? We can add kinetic energy, like I said, and we can reactivate the stretch sorting cycle. And so now what we can think about then is pausing. If you're familiar with strength training at all or the sports of weightlifting or powerlifting, some coaches will use what are called pause squats or pause lifts. So imagine an athlete like that. They go down the bottom and they hold for one, two, three, four, five seconds. They may rebound like that, but most of the time they're just going to come straight back up. That's very different than somebody who goes down to the bottom of a control and then explodes off the bottom or bounces even intentionally out of the bottom. Which one's better? Well, it depends on our goal, right? Let's think about physiology again, right? So if I'm going all the way to the bottom like that and I stop, I dissipate kinetic energy, which means I rely entirely on muscle. If I go quickly though, I'm actually doing the opposite. If I do a quick rebound, I'm relying heavily on neurology and heavy on connective tissue, especially if I do that quick rebound at the end range of motion. Right? So if I do a quick rebound like this, like a vertical jump, I'm not really going to stretch the connective tissue because I didn't really put the system on a range of motion. I'm just going to use nervous system. But if I do a full range of motion, dung, I use the nervous system, muscle spindles, and I get the connective tissue because they're really stretched out. So it depends on our goal. Are we trying to train the muscle? Are we trying to train the other parts of human movement? we got to think about this first. That's our answer. I don't know the goal. I can't tell you what to do. So here's some examples. Myself personally, I am very reactive is what I call it. Okay. So if I were to do a, a static vertical jump or a, a counter movement vertical jump, or if I w did what's called a static. So I go down, hold a quarter squat position for three or four seconds and then jump. Which one should I jump higher with? The squat and pause, the static jump, or the counter movement jump? Well, certainly it should be the counter movement jump, right? In fact, almost all of us should be that. The question is how much should they differ? If, say, I had a 30-inch vertical with my pause and jump, and then with my counter movement, I had a 40-inch vertical. Well, here's what that would tell me. I'm very good at getting power and force production when I get to use my connective tissue in the muscle spindles. And so an athlete like me, I would have benefited from a lot more pause work because I was already very good at using connective tissue in the nervous system. My muscles were not as strong though as my nervous system and my connective tissue were. So if I take the nervous system and connective tissue out of it, in other words, go down and hold and stop, I force myself to improve my weakness, which in my case was the muscle, spot, muscle side. If you look at an athlete who says, okay, I did my static and I did my counter movement and I did 30 inches with my static and 31 with my counter, then I would say the opposite. You need to actually develop your connective tissue. You need to develop the muscle spindle side of things. So you need, don't pause as much. I need you to maybe add a little bit more bounce in there and get a little bit more snappy, a little bit snappier, if you will. Right? And so both are appropriate. And so we have to think about this when we're thinking about our stretching paradigm. What are we trying to do? I know if I static stretch a ton, I'll lose some energy in the connective tissue. That's going to put more reliance on muscle. That's going to decrease my performance, but maybe if my training goal is to take some burden off the connective tissue, put it more on muscle, who cares? Right? It's a part of my developmental program. It's I'm a freshman in high school. I don't care about maximizing my jump now. Or it's off-season. I'm not in-season. What are we really trying to work for? If you don't have those questions answered, I can't answer the question of static versus dynamic, right? Or are we doing the opposite? Are we close to competition? Are we in the sport of powerlifting? Or are we using squatting to be a better football player or soccer player or tennis player? Or am I training for hypertrophy? What am I training for? Uh, someone who's training for, say, fat loss or health, 
they don't probably care if they lose 10% of power production in training if it makes them feel better, if they get into better range of motion and that allows them to get into a better position so they're not as injured as much. So all this stuff has to go into context. Now that you understand the physiology, hopefully we can have better answers. All right, so I wanna give you some real clarity here and I've got five or six take home points, but coming back to the original question, should I stretch before, after, or neither? Now I wanna see how you do here. So think, think through all the physiology. Can you envision situations, at least one, where it would be a good idea to do static stretching before working out? All right, so give me one time when it would be smart to do static before working out. I'll give you one example. Maybe somebody has really poor range of motion and it's hard for them to do anything heavy or fast without doing some stretching beforehand because they can't get into a good position, right? So every time they go to squat, for example, since they have such poor range of motion in their hip sockets, as soon as they get to any depth, they start losing their low back position. Well, I don't care if they lose 5% power. I'd rather them stay in a good position so they don't get hurt, okay? So in that particular case, I'd be happy to sacrifice a little bit of fatigue or a little bit of max force production or sprinting speed in order to gain range of motion and quality of movement. Now, I'll probably have to have a different strategy to chronically improve their range of motion. I can't just do five minutes of stretching before a workout and think that's gonna actually change anything chronically, but I might be willing to sacrifice that. Okay, now could you give me the opposite? Give me a scenario in which it would be maybe not the best idea to static stretch before a workout. Maybe an athlete in peak competition. Probably don't want to do 30 minutes of hamstring stretching before I try to win a gold medal in the 100 meter dash. Probably not a smart idea at all, right? But I wouldn't want to forget to warm up either, so in that particular case, what would I do? Maybe something more like a dynamic warm up. Okay? Now I'll give me a third scenario. All right? So give me a scenario in which, um, say, you have an athlete and it's part of their brain, and they just refuse to not stretch before the workout. They're gonna stretch no matter what you say. Or you have a coach that makes you stretch. How can you fix this problem, knowing that it's gonna compromise power a little bit, right, speed, force production, what can you do? Well, you actually have a couple options. Number one, can you increase the time between stretching and performance? Now, the research is a bit unclear here, and it kinda of depends, but basically, the longer you can give between the two, the better. You can restore some of that kinetic energy and that elasticity to the connective tissue by waiting longer. So if you can do your stretching in the morning before your night competition, you're, you're probably going to be okay. And in fact, you'll see a lot of athletes that like to do this. They'll do a good stretch, mobility, loosen up thing in the morning and then compete at night. That's probably fine. If that's not an option and you have to do it like right before your workout, well, you can probably, again, really thin research here but I think you can probably get away with doing some reactivation. And so you do your 15 or 20 minutes of static stretching, you kind of shut some things off into un unintentionally. Well, instead of just going into your squats, maybe do some hamstring activation stuff, some light, fast things, and get the hamstrings to turn back on again. I think you can mitigate some of the problems or attenuate them at least by doing a reactivation. So we need a lot of work there, and it's really tough. Uh, a lot of coaches abuse this activation concept. Uh, but it, it's getting the right idea, at least. Right? So to summarize everything we've talked about so far, number one, dynamic is pretty much always a good idea to do before training. Uh, number two, static is okay before training if a couple of things. Number one, range of motion is incredibly poor, and that is going to compromise safety. Right? We, we really don't want that. Number two, if you've got more than probably 45 minutes or so between your stretching and your performance, again, the longer the better but at least 45 minutes. And number three, if you have time to do some quote-unquote reactivation work, that will probably be, behoove you before going to performance. Best case scenario though, most of the time, I would say that the general approach would be do your dynamic movement stuff before your workout, do your workouts, and then if you need to gain the chronic range of motion, you can use that time either post-training or the day off to improve range of motion. So you can do a lot of static stretching after your workouts uh, to work on your flexibility, range of motion, and mobility, or on your off day. 
things like that. Another thing I didn't throw in here, but we talked about briefly, maybe I should come back and make a video on this separately. Let me know. Maybe I did enough here. I don't know. But this concept of pausing versus not pausing to intentionally train the muscle system versus in the connective tissue. Okay, so depending on what we're trying to train for, we may intentionally add some pausing or some holding, which is just static stretching, if you will, right? Static holding. Uh, or we may do the exact opposite, depending on what the need of the, athletes, the athlete is or, or the situation that we're in. So that's it for this video. I'm not sure. I think this will be a 25 minute, but maybe we might miss the mark and I have to make it a short 55 minute physiology video. If you enjoyed this, I, I greatly appreciate your support. Uh, the best thing you can do, of course, is subscribe and all that jazz. I, I, I'm the worst with marketing and stuff. I don't, don't care for it really at all. It's not what I'm after. But share, help people. I know there's a lot of people out there who maybe had some exercise science training in, uh, a long time ago, but now they're coaches, they're practitioners, uh, they're personal trainers, and they would love a, a, a re-bup or be able to learn uh, some of the stuff or a reminder. So just share it, help me get the word out. Um, in addition, there's a lot of people that are actually currently coaching that never had the chance or couldn't afford to go to school. And this is re these are really videos for those folks. So a uh, goal, if you're new to this program, my real goal is to put basically my entire university exercise science curriculum Put all that up in these videos for free. So this is your first time. I've got a ton of other videos in this big long format, this 55 or 25 minute version, or even the five minute version if you're just looking for the quick answers. So again, I appreciate all the support. Um, you can check out the Patreon page if you can make contributions there. If not, no worries. And uh, for those of you in my class, we'll see you tomorrow or the next day. We're gonna do some of this stuff and we're gonna get our stretch on. So. Thank you for the support, and uh, we'll see you next time.